I would say good mega, learn mega more events, from your failures than from your successes. Specifically in some ways this has some resonance. Many. So as you've heard, I am a scientist. And I believe that all of you are scientists as well. So I'm going to explain that to you today. But one thing, one myth we have to dispel, scientists don't wear lab coats. <laughs> we'll get back to that. So I want to tell you a story. The story starts on July 4th, 2012. This is the CERN Auditorium. CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics in Geneva, Switzerland. This was a seminar that happened on that day. There were two very large experiments, 3,000 people each, the ATLAS experiment and the CMS experiment, both on the Large Hadron Collider. This was simply a presentation of their latest results. Uh, the, as is usual when we have presentations uh, at CERN, there's a lot of charts, a lot of graphs. I'm not expecting you, by the way, to understand necessarily uh, what's on these. I just wanted to point out the important number on here, and this is slide number 106 out of 116, where we finally get to the, the, the final result. This was the, the slides of Joe Incandela of the CMS collaboration. He's their spokesperson. Not to be outdone, uh, the uh, spokesperson of Atlas, Fabiola Gianotti, uh, gave her talk in beautiful Comic Sans with a perfect color scheme to highlight the results. And the final result, of course, is 5.0 multiplied by some Greek letter sigma. Uh, so, you know, this, this was fascinating. Uh, this, we all went to, to watch these talks. Uh, there was also a conference going on at the same time in Melbourne, Australia where many of us were attending. We have big conferences from time to time to get us out of the lab. And uh, so the, the entire uh, uh, colloquium was, was uh, yeah, presentation was webcast. And it was webcast also to the public in case anybody in the public was interested in this topic. It turns out that by the end of the week, there was a lot of interest. In fact, one billion people, probably many of you, saw in one form or another video that came from that webcast. That begs one to ask the question, why? To understand this, I'm going to take you back to a conference that happened before this, one of the first uh, particle physics conferences. This took place also on July 4th, but it was uh, 2 million uh, and, and, and 12 BC. And uh, this conference was very well attended at the time. And in this case, the results that were presented uh, were the ones of, you see Zog here, who is the head of the experiment, presenting the results. Her student, Og, had done the first collision, had smashed together two rocks, and had found out that rocks are made up of smaller rocks. This, don't, don't laugh, this was groundbreaking at the time. Uh, this result was very important, and people paid attention. Wow, what is, what is Og doing here? How is this going to help me? What, what's going on here? Well, you ask this question again, why? Why was there great interest in what Og was doing with these two rocks? Well, I want to describe to you uh, what I've divided up, and I'm going to talk to you about a topic for which I'm not trained, but uh, which I've looked at quite a bit in my uh, work in communication. Three facets of evolution. I don't know where I came up with that word facet, but it seemed like an appropriate one for this. Three important facets. How is it that, that, that species in general survive? The first one's an obvious one. We all try to stay alive. Survival of the individual. We do this in various ways. Uh, sometimes we get very strong, very fast. We have big teeth. We, we can eat other animals. We do what we have to do to survive, to get our food. In other cases, we simply try not to be eaten. It's another way for individuals to survive. You can see here by this frog. You see the frog, right? <laughs> Who sees the frog? Does anybody see the frog? Excellent. I, guess that's what I, thought. I didn't see it either. I even read where it was in the picture and I didn't see it. Uh, let's see. Can you see it now? It's very hard. Even after this, I have a lot of friends who, who, who couldn't pick that out. So this guy, he's survived. 
He's throughout, and, and, and so you evolve certain ways for this individual. There's other ways for a species to continue, and one is survival of the group. Okay, sacrifice, potentially. Uh, there's no really good reason for a bee to die when it stings, right? I mean, it does. Uh, that doesn't really help the individual much at all. Why on earth would a bee sting if it's going to die afterwards? But that bee is defending the group. It's defending the queen and its prodigy. Uh, it's keeping the group together, survival of the group. Of course, I had to put this in because, well, I'm a nerd. Uh, <laughs> As, as Spock, as you all know, as Spock said, uh, the, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or as Kirk added to that, of the one. So in this case, Spock uh, is, is sacrificing himself so that everybody on the Enterprise could, could survive. Okay, the third facet, which is the one I want to talk about here, is survival of future generations. We all know that animals, any of us who are parents or who have parents, which I think covers most of us here, um, know that parents will do anything for their children to survive. They will sacrifice themselves to do anything to defend their children. That's one way, okay? Sacrificing yourself for future generations. Another bit of sacrifice that we often do involves this, the, the brain. We sacrifice our time and our efforts to understand the world around us. This is something that the human brain is extraordinarily inefficient, and also the brain of some other animals as well. I talk about humans, but there's other species who follow all of these different facets. Uh, it's not very efficient. I think it uses somewhere around a third of our calories, and someone I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong, but it uses a huge amount of, of energy to keep going. And uh, it's not necessary to use all that energy to find food or sex to stay alive for the day. Uh, no, you need that for other things. One of the things we developed is something called curiosity. We look at the world around us. Comprehension. We try to understand what is this all about. And communication. We communicate to our peers what we have learned so that we can add on to the future. We can learn and carry things forward. We ask big questions when we're curious. As I said, we don't just try to find out where the next thing is to eat. We ask big questions. We look out at the sky at night and we say, where do we come from? What are we made of? Are there any rules behind all of this? And there's many other very, very big questions that we ask ourselves and that we've continued to ask since the beginning of time. We try to answer these questions. So more important than just asking them, we try to answer them. And when we try to answer these questions, we usually find out much more than we expect. Example of Og. Og might or might not have been thinking about the industrial age when he was smashing the rocks together, learning that they are composed of different things. My guess is no, he wasn't thinking that. He was simply curious. Uh, Thales of Miletus was someone who studied magnetism. He looked at different materials, how they were magnetic. He rubbed things as well, learned about electricity. My guess is that on his mind, and I never talked to him myself, but uh, was not power grids and how we're going to get energy to the rest of the world. Probably not. He was curious. Sir Isaac Newton saw apples, equated apples falling to planets going around the sun. That's an amazing thing that he did there to understand gravity. My guess is that he wasn't thinking, hey, now we can launch geosynchronous satellites, we can communicate all the way around the world. Probably not. Not sure. Again, I, I, I'm old, but I didn't meet him. These guys were brilliant. Niels Bohr, uh, Albert Einstein, uh, they thought of quantum mechanics, how to look at very small things, uh, or special relativity. What about things, what happens to things when they go close to the speed of light? I, this is just a hunch, because again, I haven't met these guys. They probably, probably weren't thinking of this and how we would be able to, you know, look at videos of cats wherever we go around the world. <laughs> or other things which are quite useful. Probably not. Fundamental research builds the tools that help our future generations to have the tools they need to survive. 
That's what's important about what they were doing. They weren't driven by that thought. They were simply curious and did the research. Let me get back to the first talk. 1964, a gentleman named Peter Higgs, who you see here, thought about a big problem. How is it that fundamental particles attain mass? Why do they have mass? He was not alone. There was also uh, Robert Braut, Francois Angler, who were also thinking about the same problem. They, they proposed papers around the same time. Uh, they came up with an amazing idea, which is that all around us, everywhere in the universe, shortly after the Big Bang, suddenly appeared a field. And that field, when a particle goes through it, when a fundamental particle goes through it, it attains mass. Its interaction with that field gives it mass. So, great, all you got to do is look around and find this field. It's everywhere. We should find it. Well, it wasn't so easy. It took us a long, long time. We had to build this enormous tunnel. It's this 27-kilometer round tunnel that houses the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. It's all underground. Above ground, there are cows and houses and whatever you expect, but it's all underground, roughly 100 meters underground. And we had to build some of those beautiful and complex experiments ever at different points on this tunnel. So in that tunnel, we collide protons together at four different places. Two of those places are the experiments I mentioned before, the ATLAS experiment and the CMS experiment. They had to look at hundreds of trillions of collisions to pick out some which gave evidence to the existence of that field. You guys all know, of course, that when there is a field there is a particle, right? And when there's a particle, there's a field. That's quantum field theory. Now you know quantum field theory. Okay. There it is. This is the evidence they had. On the left, you can see the, the ATLAS experiment. On the right, the CMS experiment. There are two uh, competing but also cooperating experiments on the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, they compete in that they built their detectors completely differently. There's completely different people working on them, but they're both really looking for the same thing. And as soon as we see each other's work, we cooperate with each other to understand what we've seen. These are, uh, these are event displays that show you the results of the collisions. Uh, they, I cannot say those are Higgs bosons that you're seeing there because there are a lot of things which look like them, but probably they are. And we can tell that from statistics. They found it. This was very exciting. And when we made this announcement in 2012, the world somehow noticed something important happened here. Our world gained a bit of knowledge, a new understanding of the world that we live in. And that gives us tools for the future. Are there any other questions? Are we done? Can we shut this thing down and, and move on to other things? Absolutely not. This is actually the very beginning of the LHC. It has 20 more years that it's going to run, and we have some relatively big questions to try to answer. Uh, well, we're back to this one. <laughs> Where do we come from? That's a question we're working on very hard. The ALICE experiment on the LHC spends a lot of work on this, trying to understand the conditions that happen about a microsecond after the Big Bang. Uh, where did antimatter go? Why is it that you guys were able to sit down in the seats and not explode or shake hands to the friends next to you and you didn't blow up in a huge amount of, of firing energy? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, why is it that there aren't anti-galaxies out there? We don't see them. There is just matter. There was a huge explosion 13.8 billion years ago. Everything disappeared except the dust that we are. And we don't know what happened to antimatter. Big question. What are holding galaxies together? Galaxies should not spin the way they do. They shouldn't exist at all. We're missing approximately 80% of the matter in them. We can't see it. We call it dark matter because, well, we just don't know. Okay? But we don't know what's there and what's going there. This is not answered by our current models. Back to this. What are we made of? Is it keep going down? Is it Russian dolls all the way down? We don't know. We're at the level of quarks now. Could there be something more? We're investigating that. And why are forces so incredibly different? Uh, I had this wonderful uh, meal yesterday with a little beer, well, you know, like that, one liter, at the Half Brauhaus, and uh, I felt the strong force of gravity. But in fact, gravity is not so strong. It is, if you compare a couple of electrons and their electromagnetic charge, how they push away from each other from their gravitational 
charge, which pulls them together, the difference in the strength of those, of those forces is a million, 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 million times. It's 10 to the 36 times. We don't understand that at all. No clue. One potential bizarre answer to that is that there are other spatial dimensions out there. It's pretty far out there, but then again, Higgs was way out there as well. Could there be other dimensions that gravity lives in and that we don't usually live in? Big questions. So, no big deal. We have something new. These guys, when they were thinking about the Higgs boson, weren't necessarily thinking, we're going to do this because we're going to give a tool to future generations, but they gave us a tool, the Higgs boson, and by measuring its properties, we can get some hints about those other questions. So, we're going to solve all these problems. We're all scientists, right? No problem. Let's get to work. Are we all scientists? I am not a scientist. But trees need carbon dioxide. And how can something that trees need be bad? I am not a scientist, but we have an unlimited supply of fossil fuels that God wants us to dig up by any means necessary. I am not a scientist, but if I dump this cooler of ice on the ground, in a few hours, most of it will still be frozen, and the ice caps are much bigger, so. <laughs> okay, one thing I should say, it is a parody, it is a parody, but, <laughs> This parody came out shortly after 49 of the 100 United States senators, people who make the laws there, decided that in fact human activity was not causing global warming. So there are some of us who have not evolved, and our job <laughs> as people who have evolved and who are scientists is to make sure that we keep thinking of the big questions. We keep looking to the future. We have been through a time in the past where we did not. We call that the Dark Ages. But what we did at the end of the Dark Ages is we put on our lab coats. We put on our artists' frocks. We became philosophers. We thought about the world around us. And try to find solutions to things. We call that the Renaissance, and that's the world that we really want to live in. So I challenge all of you to put on your lab coat and ask the big questions. Thank you. <laughs>